Welcome to the 70th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So paranormal. I think there's supposed to be a damn. Oh, what did I say? Goddamn. <laughs> My name is Jason Knight, uh, host of the show, and with me, as always, is producer extraordinaire, Mr. Oscar Spector. Oh, I thought you were going to give me that uh, to say the name. I would have said Lexi Raven. Lexi Raven yeah. is. I would have said that. Oh, so as you're, my name. You're Lexi Raven today. I am Lexi Raven today. So Are I'm you? just going to play on my <laughs> phone and do a Sims battle. Is that what they do? They battle. Yeah, just Sims? vaguely pay attention and vaguely do anything. <laughs> right. No, I am Oscar Spector. Lexi is not with us. She's working for Realsies right now. So. For Realsies. Yep. Good. Um, so the big seven O. This is our seventieth episode. Uh, That's is insane. It, is that a landmark for you? It, it's for us. No. I mean, it's not for me. So, <laughs> Well, no. How many episodes is your show on? Oh, no. Uh, well, since I restarted, after you guys started, we're on our 50 something. But before that, oh, I was on episode 100 and something for sure. 100 and something. Wow. One, 170 maybe around there. Wow. Well, 170. That. Well, we got 70 under our belt. I think at 100, we should celebrate or do something. We should do something really crazy. Uh, take off our pants. Is that, is Mine that are already of, off. Is that the kind of crazy you were... Yes. Or okay. Cool. That's fun. That'd be or fun. Or throw stuff off the freeway ramp or something? Is it? No. No. Not that kind of crazy. No. Okay. Pants off is good. Pants off. Okay. Sounds like great. Everyone will communally take their pants off while listening to the show. That's what the celebration will be. Take them off. Be National Pants Off Day. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I've already started. Yeah, you have. <laughs> I'm sitting on your chairs. You know, pretty hairy for an Italian. Make it. <laughs> So yeah, episode seventy. It's the big, big seven zero. Episode sixty nine. Last episode. Uh, not as out. fun as that. The, the number suggests, though. I was really proud of everybody on that show for not uh, making use of the fact that it's episode sixty nine in a I childish way. I almost did. But uh, you reserved yourself, and I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I think it, it didn't happen because Joe and Dave just didn't know what episode it was. Yeah. <laughs> they don't fucking know. <laughs> No clue. That's right. They would have said something. Probably. They would have absolutely have said. Right. That, I mean, that's just opening the door for Joe. Yeah, I didn't even know what episode it was either. No, I didn't know. I didn't know. I had my notes up. I didn't have. It. Yeah. yeah. So I but appreciated I that. It. Sorry, I couldn't join that last episode, but I'm glad you guys kept it going. I mean, it felt great uh, taking a break from you a little bit. Uh, I get that. No, I'm kidding. You're great. Uh, going um, back and listening, to, I enjoyed yeah. hearing Dave and Joe back on the show. Yes, I and just Jojo could have been there. Oh, and Jojo too. That's right. He was there. I think Lexi said a word or two. She said the so goddamn paranormal or God, she said, so damn That's paranormal. right. So damn paranormal. It sounded like she wanted to kill herself as she said no, that. She, she it was didn't so know. grudgingly she, said. She, I guess she didn't listen to me when I told her I'm going to do the paranormal part and give you the mic real quick, right? Like this? Yeah. And, um, and I guess she didn't hear me because when I pointed to her, she like hesitated and then said it. You could tell. Yes. You yeah. caught her by surprise. I right? caught her by surprise. And I'm like. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. It's not that I'm paranormal. Whatever. Yeah. I don't care. It's okay. Fuck you guys. Yeah. Make me come to these recordings. <laughs> I don't even want to be here. Uh, but she That's kind home. of the impression, the impression her, her voice. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gave. I'm with you, man. But I, I, I love it anyway. Um, so what did you think having the guys back on? I mean, I'm already sick of them. <laughs> already. <laughs> uh, I, I can... Uh, I'd rather do a solo cast. No, no, no. It was great. Um, I've been wanting to touch base with them for uh, at least, um, I think, three episodes ago is when I first started thinking about it because I'm like, if we are too far apart, um, people will f either forget that they exist or we get a bunch of new listeners that don't know they exist. You're, yeah, And we got to right. have them come in at least every at least every other or every third or one, and whatever, enough to people know that they are a common staple to our show. That they are part of the show. So I was worried about that. So I was glad we did it. So Dave, I think we were talking offline, Oscar, probably at least seven episodes that Dave hasn't been on. I yeah, something say. like that, yeah. It's been Joe a was probably yeah. late November 2017. That long? That long. No, it wasn't. Yes. Was it that long? It was that long. It has been that long. No, it hasn't. It, it, if it you said January, I'm, I think it may have been January. It has no. to be. It really? has to be, yes. I know he was sick for like two, three episodes straight from something horrible that led him to a hospital. Remember that? Yes. Is yes. that how it started? It did start that way. But he was already not there because we did the Christmas show with the Chicago Ripper crew. He wasn't that. there for that. So that was in December. Yeah, I guess So we're was. looking at November, December since Joe's actually been on the show. So it was good to hear yeah. good old Joe... Uh, with all his Joe-isms Joe <laughs> again on the yeah. show. So. Okay. Wow. I enjoyed listening to it. Um, 
I hope you enjoyed your break, bitch, because you're coming back now. Coming back. I'm back. I'm in full effect. I think I got a really good topic uh, this episode. You never not do. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. you make me feel nice. See, this is how I do it, folks. You give treat him like shit for like 90% of the time. You give 10% compliment, and it feels like 100% compliment. You're like an abusive yeah. husband. Yeah, I am. Giving Jesus. you notes for people out there. That's right. Oscar evil. Yeah, it's a good show topic, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I wanted to make it for, for episode 69. I wanted to be there with Joe and Dave, but I just had such a long week uh, leading up to the release of that episode that yeah, I just... About I a seven-day week. Couldn't get out of the house, man. I just couldn't couldn't do it. I literally couldn't do it. Yeah, at some point you were like, I need to see my family. I'm like, Dude, I had to it. see my family. I, I was gone Monday through Friday, uh, the week leading up to that episode. Mm-hmm. A lot of traveling listeners by now know that i hate airplanes i hate everything about airplanes but the sequel he's good with and i had four flights that week Mm -hmm. bopping around the midwest uh first i I flew from chicago to sioux falls south dakota sioux falls then from oh joe erie's calling right now actually how going um well get back to you but so I, i had to fly from chicago to sioux falls spent a couple days in sioux falls south dakota then from Sioux Falls, I had to fly back to Chicago and then jump on another plane to head out to Cincinnati. Drove around Cincinnati and Columbus, and then I was supposed to come fly back to Chicago from Columbus on a Friday, right? Hmm. So it was a long, stressful week. I was doing things during that week that I'd never done before, so my OCD kicked in leading up to this week because I want to make sure I perform well for my, my big boy job, and everything worked out great. It was couldn't have been better, but... Good. By the time I got to Columbus on that Friday, I was burnt. I was tired. My endorphins weren't flying anymore, so I was really tired. I was kind of crashing from being really anxious. About yeah, kind of like a sugar crash. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. And I'm sitting at a, a Columbus airport, and um, I have a ticket, but I don't have a seat on the airplane. What? Yes. They, they do this because sometimes they oversell flights. So sometimes people without actual seats uh, mm-hmm. get bumped or they'll, they'll offer them money. For other people who actually do have a seat, and okay. it's crazy. Um, so I'm sitting at the the gate, mm-hmm. at the desk at my gate, waiting for my plane, um, and I'm trying to go to the desk to get a a seat on the plane. They want you to actually check in at the gate with your ticket, then they'll assign you a seat, right? Okay. So I'm standing in line, and there's this fucking guy in front of me trying to go to to London Heathrow, mm-hmm. and there's a queue of people behind me. We're just standing. 30 minutes, this gate attendant is helping this jagoff get to, <laughs> sorry, get to, I'm getting angry again. I know. Again, London Heathrow. It's great. We're all fucking going to Chicago. Why yeah. are you helping this guy uh, who's going to London Heathrow? And he wasn't even going through Chicago. He just <sighs> walked up to this gate, asked for help, and this gate attendant ignored everybody else in line yeah. to help this guy go to London Heathrow. Because at the same time, I'm watching on the flight board for my flight going from Columbus to Chicago – Delay. Oh, no. Delay. Delay. Your least and it's word. going in 15-minute increments. Delay. 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 <laughs> I'm waiting. And wait. This guy's talking about London Heathrow. I'm getting heated. I'm so mad. I'm missing family. I'm, I want to get home. And all, I don't know what came over me. All of a sudden, I just yelled out, fuck this. And I took my t- plane ticket, and I slammed it on the desk, at oh the gate God. desk. Really? And I walked out of the goddamn airport. Really? Rented a car. Yeah, and drove six and a half hours. You kidding? Straight home. Uh, so I didn't get home till super late. I was so aggravated. I, I just couldn't make it out for the recording. Did you check up on the on the flight? I don't know if you could have. From yeah, the they were they were delayed a, a further hour after I left. So would it have made the difference, or would you now that looking back, would you have stayed at the airport? No, because at least I was doing something. I hear you. I'm heading I'm towards with you. my destination. Even that is the, the answer I wanted. Yes, yes. I lost. At the end of the day, probably two hours. I so, would have been home two so hours So, folks, early. every time you see someone at the airport flip out or do something like that, because I see that all the time. I don't fly nearly as often as you do, but I do fly on occasion. And um, you always see something, aggravation, some sort of pre-violence violence, uh, <laughs> pre-violence. like someone yelling about to start something. Right, right. And um, now you know. You just gave an example of you flipping out saying, fuck this. You I know? did, too. So to everyone around them, they're like, oh, man, that guy's flipping out. Um, but they don't know the stresses. Right. It can happen to anyone. And I'll tell you, it's it a breaking felt, point. There is a breaking point. It was in my mind, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I did it. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. Just fuck this, slam down the ticket, and out I went. People thought I was out of my mind. Yeah. But the airlines have taken so much time from my life. 
And yeah, that it felt so good just to say, throw caution to the wind. Fuck this. I'm I'm taking a car home, and I got my money back on the flight. Good. So it all worked out. Are you better? But after that week, man, I just I couldn't get out. I couldn't leave. I wanted to be home with the fam. So yeah, good job carrying on that torch with Joe and Dave. Oh, it's an easy torch. It doesn't weigh much. And reintroducing the audience to them. So yes, yeah, definitely. Um, and they also they live closer than you, so it's great for me on the mileage. Easier, yeah, yes. good. So it was easy. Um, should we say where we are now or no? We are recording north side of Chicago at Oscar Specter's home for for the first time in a long ever. Oh my god, is it it's ever been, or a long time? No, I think we've done one or two here. But of my show or of our sh- of this show? Oh, it might have been a year show. That's what I'm saying. Is Another that the first podcast. one? Is this the first time here we're doing SOS? I think so. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. yeah 70th so, and the first time recording here. Look at that. Look at that. So if you hear, like, I don't know, like Mexicans, <laughs> like... Mariachis. Yes. Or um, <laughs> Cucaracha. Uh, wow. I can't even think of tropes right now. People anyway, Elote. A pinata, el- the Elote Man. Elote. Uh, right. I love Elotes. I love when white people say Elote. Oh, no, no, no. It's Elote. I know. But I'm saying I love when white people say that. Um, anyway. Well, I apologize in advance. We're recording in the living room, but I'm saying that now. But yeah, it's uh, still Chicago, still Northwest Side. We're not lying, so it's still cool. <laughs> <laughs> you might hear a gunshot or six. Or six. But you know, never know more than that, though. No. They usually get their guy. Like six. When you get to seven, that's when you worry. Yeah, because then they're aiming for a massacre that's or right. a spree. You know, that's you know, right. Exactly. That's how you know. So now that the stage is set, the stage is set. Did yeah, I you bought you, Thank you for bringing the candle over. Yeah, well, before we get into that, hmm. we got our first voicemail. Oh, shit, that's right. We got our first voicemail. Yeah. Yeah. So, listeners, uh, you know, I've said in past few episodes, you could call Chicago area code 872-529-0767, 872-529-0767. Leave us a voicemail, and uh, your best voicemails will play at the beginning of the shows, Right. Oh, so, so I'm spicing it. Oh, so it people took, have heard it already? No, haven't heard it yet. Okay. So you're going to cut it in. Oh, okay. At a certain point. Now. Wait, now? Right now. Hi. I've been living, listening to the Supernatural Current Studies podcast since inception. I find it informative, insightful, and entertaining. I like the banter between the group. I always think the information is compelling. And I love the amount of time it's taken in the research, as well as the on-site visits interviewing other people. Um feel that these guys are passionate about what they do, and that is definitely translated in the podcast. So continue doing a great job. you got a listener for life. You have a listener for life. So that was our first message. It was a good message. It was it, That was a kind one, because I was worried opening up this number, what kind of messages people would leave us. And we did say we, we would print anything. And we did say we would play anything. Yes. Yeah. It's got to be good, but it could be good, bad. It could be good. Yeah, it could be about, you know, just... My voice, horrible, graining on their nightmares day and night, and they can't stop listening to the show no matter what. They love us. They hate us. You know, it could be about that, and as long as it's good, we'll play it. Yeah, but they got to give us a reason why they hate us. Don't just say, you guys fucking suck, but tell us why. I'll play it. Oscar will play it. Like I said, good. Although subjective is also a bias. (laughs) We'll see how that (laughs) works. (laughs) And that person, they didn't leave a, a, a name, so whoever you are, sir, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for leaving us the kind voicemail. Again, listeners, 872-529-0767. That voice, that could have been your voice. I mean, it still could be. It still can we're not, be. This is not the last show we're doing. I would say, though, real quick, that uh, if you do call or even send feedback in the future, give out your first name and uh, where you are calling from. Good call. Like city and state or, or, or different country or whatever. Uh, just, you know, we kind of call it a hat. You know what? That's, that's great advice. Yeah. Good. Maybe we'll instantly know, I don't like, care about oh, your... shit, there's a haunted bridge there we know about, you know. Just right. Or something. Good. Yeah, we don't care about your last name or anything. But no, yeah, we won't say that. First yeah. name, where you're from, that right. sort of stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Good, good. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Good. Uh, job? Good job, Oscar. Thank you. Good I don't know. I, <laughs> I got that from other podcasts that do listen. Good stuff. advice. So, thank you. That's the word I was looking for, advice. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I got another little bit of housekeeping. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let you decide on this one, if it counts mm-hmm. or not. All right. Okay. So it might have been actually three episodes ago at this point. Uh-huh. You said for our listeners, you gave them a task. Mm-hmm. Do you remember this? You gave them a task and said you wanted them to go to iTunes and post their favorite Bob Dylan lyrics. Do you remember this? 
Uh, I barely remember today. And, and Lexi's like, well, what if they don't know Bob Dylan? And, and do you remember this conversation? Uh, I'm pretty sure I said suck it up because everyone knows Bob Dylan. Right, something like something that. Something like that, yeah. Something but someone, like that. someone did it. This someone, is audience interaction. This is good stuff. I love it. Someone's this. actually doing what I say. Some, well, kind of. Oh. So this is where your judgment comes in. I'll, oh. I'll let you call this one if it counts or not. They sent it to a carrier pigeon? <laughs> no, but oh. so someone did post the Bob Dylan lyrics, but it wasn't on iTunes. Oh, uh, YouTube? It was on our YouTube channel. Nice. Supernatural Current Studies on YouTube. Oh, that totally counts. Now, oh, good. So, okay, Kimberly Johnson, if you're listening, hey, Oscar, say hello to Kimberly. Uh, Kim John, what's up? <laughs> oh, I get it. I see what you did there. See? You like Kim that? John, yes. Yeah. Uh, as I said, now all our friends are going to call her that. She's going to start hating me. It's and she'll great. never listen to the show again. Uh, well, Fuck, we just lost her. <laughs> lost in the future. She, Come back. We, got, we got her now. So, Kimberly Johnson, uh, hello, a new sapro- super- <laughs> supernatural. <laughs> I haven't even been drinking. A new supernatural occurrence studies YouTube subscriber wrote that her favorite Bob Dylan lyrics are mm-hmm. To her, death is quite romantic. She wears an iron vest. Her profession is her religion. Her sin is her lifelessness. God, don't you just want to have coffee with Bob Dylan every time you hear I know. his lyrics? Wh- which is from a song called Desolation Row mm-hmm. from Dylan's 1965 album called Highway 61 Revisited. Uh, my favorite use of that song in a movie might be... So you've heard of this one before? A cover of it uh, put in the Watchmen movie. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in there. Because I had to look those lyrics up. I wasn't familiar with the song. So you, you're familiar with the song? I'm familiar with the song. I, I, I didn't know it from the lyrics until you told me the title. Like, yes, now. So I'm not that good or anything. Got it. Uh, I'm not the biggest Bob Dylan fan or anything. I am definitely a fan, just not the biggest one. But thank you for that. It's a great, great lyrics. Isn't that awesome? I love it. So wait, that's that audience And you can, you, can, you, you can also retrofit almost any Bob Dylan lyrics to explain any emotion you have. That's how good the guy was, in my opinion. You can like literally pick anything. Uh, not pick anything, but you can find the one that fits your mood and your emotion and then say that, and most likely people will understand what you're saying huh. if you can ever, like, Never figure out. Way. Yeah, I used to do that as a, as a joke at first. Like, when I hated someone, someone was annoying me, like, at work, I would have, like, a, a Bob Dylan lyric. Like, I don't know what. I can't think of an example. It's been years. But, like, I used to do that every once in a while. Interesting. Because you could just kind of cherry – you can do anything. He definitely was special. People yes. love him or hate him. Doesn't seem to be a lot of middle of the road people when it comes to Dylan. That's true. But uh, that's true. Which like is him. all the best out that way. How do you think? How do you think Dylan would have would have sang those lyrics? What would he have done? To her, death is quite romantic. I mean, this is 60s. she wears an iron vest. He, he, I don't know if he really like I don't know. If, I don't know. You know, he didn't. He he only toned that up for the other some songs. He didn't do it for all songs. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, that sounds more right. I mean, you did a way better impression than I could. You think? Do you yes. want to give it a try? No. Come on. I know you're going to ask me. And... Uh, I tried to set you up. Yep. Sorry, nope. listeners. So, so, they don't want it. <laughs> well, Kimberly Johnson, she commented those lyrics on our YouTube video called um, Mysterious Shrine Discovered in the Nevada Desert, which coincides with Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast episode 54, a bonus episode also called Mysterious Shrine Discovered in the Nevada Desert. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Kimberly, it's great to have you as a listener and a viewer, mm-hmm. and I, I hope we keep you around and, and keep you entertained. Dude, Kim John, good job. Kim John. Do you remember that episode when we found that weird body shrine murder site in the desert way know. back when? I don't even know where I am. <laughs> no. You were there. I know. Uh, yeah, I do like it. It was very freaky. It was freaky. So, Kim John. Are we going to mention she the other thing the about thing. that place? The other thing you told us in a uh, text thread? About that place? I'm being vague about it because I don't want to mention it if you don't want to mention it. About someone else? No. Okay, got it. We'll keep that one off air. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, listeners, episode 54 of the Supernatural Currencies podcast. You could uh, uh, listen to what we're talking about here. Um, or uh, Mysterious Shrine Discovered in the Nevada Desert on YouTube. Good? Yeah, solid. A couple things uh, additional to run down. We did get a new iTunes review. Sweet. And it's a five-star review that says, These guys rock. You can tell a lot of work goes into this show. Very enlightening. Well, the show is, the, 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 the work goes into it. It's all Jay right here. Oh, so he's you. the rocker. I'm the roller. There you go. Yeah. Do you know who left us that comment? Oh, oh, no. Sue Knight, my mom. Sue Knight. Isn't it awesome? I think she it's... finally got an iPhone, and yeah. first thing she did was load our podcast. 
on oh. the podcast app. So that's from my mama. She's the best. Thanks, ma. But yes. also, like, no offense, it doesn't count. It's from your mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hey, the iTunes. It's like when a, when a boy in school is like, "I'm handsome." My mom tells me I'm the handsomest boy ever, and all. <laughs> you know, like that bitch don't count. <laughs> she goes. <laughs> that don't count. Yeah, it's not so, a real iTunes review. So you know how many iTunes reviews do we have? Minus iTunes, one. iTunes counts. iTunes counts. So we have yes. sixteen iTunes reviews. Fifteen, counts. and they're all straight five stars. Cool, because we're great at what we do. I all mean, right. I can't get my mom to do that much. Couple, yeah, well, why don't she? Why don't she leave us a comment? I don't even, no, I mean, to uh, my show. <laughs> 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 My show first, then then yours. Why do you talk about fantasma? Fantasma. What's that? Oh, isn't that how you say it? Isn't that how you say it in Spanish? Ghosts, fantasma. Oh my God! You said it so strangely. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. I guess. I said it very white. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And you said it like that movie Phantasm, but with an A at the end. Oh, Angus yeah. Scrim. Wow, deep he's cut. the tall man. Yeah, I know. You good with that name? Yeah. Um, Angus. Angus. That's an old name. His parents hated his ass. Oh, really? Love beef. <laughs> <laughs> would that be? Yeah, it would be beef. Yeah, right. Yeah. Angus beef. Yeah. Contact us at, on Facebook at Chicago Ghost Podcast. Western Union accepts all telegrams. We we we'll, we'll take mail. Although I'm not going to give you our address. Uh, <laughs> oh, we can take it then. <laughs> at Chicago Ghosts on Twitter and Instagram. Supernatural Occurrence Studies on YouTube. Contact at ChicagoGhostPodcast.com, Oscar. I heard last episode you didn't know our email address. Nope. Contact I'm so sorry. at ChicagoGhostPodcast.com. <laughs> and, of course, if you love what we do, if you love the show, or if you want us to go out on a, a paranormal adventure in hopes we get hurt, killed, or maimed to bring you podcasts, Patreon.com forward slash Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. Forward slash pay me my money. Give me money. Patreon.com forward slash Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. Become a patron. Receive cool stuff. And with that, why don't we hear from our sponsors and get into today's topic? No. Do you want to say something else? Oh. Did uh, I miss something? No. No, I was kidding. Oh, you're kidding. Let's get into our sponsors. I'm sorry. <laughs> now. <laughs> Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com, with over 200,000 audio programs to choose from, Audible has you covered. Horror, mystery, true crime, sci-fi, nonfiction, and more. All narrated by A-list celebrities and very unique performers. Go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash SOS radio. That's audibletrial.com forward slash SOS radio. And claim your free 30-day trial and free audiobook now. That's audibletrial.com forward slash SOS radio. This episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast is brought to you by Grammarly.com. Grammarly. Built by linguists and language lovers, Grammarly's writing app finds and corrects hundreds of complex writing errors instantly, so you don't have to. Copy and paste any English text into Grammarly's online text editor, or install the free Grammarly extension for Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, and get to writing. Download Grammarly now for free at www.getgrammarly.com forward slash ghost that's getgrammarly.com forward slash ghost bring Grammarly's powerful algorithms straight to wherever you are writing online Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and more what are you waiting for? download Grammarly for free at getgrammarly.com forward slash ghost and we are back. Thank you for listening uh, to that message from our sponsors. Well, folks, the lights are turned down low. Mm. The drinks are flowing. Mm. The ceremonial candle is lit. Let's start this episode. Say, Jay, have you seen a movie called Red Dragon? Or even if you're old enough, Manhunter. I, I, I have seen them, yes. It's the Hannibal Lecter series. Yes, yes. It's a Red Dragon is a remake of Manhunter. Um, who is it? It doesn't matter. Anyway, do you remember the killer, the main killer, the Tooth Fairy? Um, Ralph Finesse? Ralph Finesse? Ralph Fiennes in the, Fiennes, in the, in the remake. And then uh, it was that 
T- Tim Noonan? <laughs> Tim Noonan. What's his, Noonan is that name. I remember his, he's a creepy looking guy. He always plays creepy looking guys. Um, he's a main killer in Manhunter. Anyway, you know how the killer in that movie, he, w- he carved the Chinese symbol for Red Dragon on a tree to, uh, outside his, uh, one of his victim's homes. Do you remember that? I do remember that. Yes. Yeah, and the, it was just that symbol. It was a that symbol, weird like, symbol. The Chinese character of Red Dragon, yeah. you know, calling himself that. That's it, right. It kind of reminded me of like a placard commemorating the murdering that's going to happen. That does happen to the family. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but that's how I felt. That's right. You're right. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, something about today's creepy, show. Creepy man, creepy. There's something about today's show and smiling faces, even simple emoji style smiling faces that reminds me of that about today's topic. Very astute. That's right. There is some correlation there. Okay. Why don't you tell us what that's what? What, what are you going to do to us today? <sighs> okay. So today's topic, I don't even know if it's real. Oh, one I of don't those. know if it's real. One of those. There's a huge camp of people who say this is a thing and this needs to be recognized and dealt with. Mm-hmm. Then there's a whole camp of other people who say. It's complete bullshit. It's urban legend. This thing doesn't exist. Okay. Um, and those that group of people who feel this isn't real, it's an urban legend, it's just coincidence at the end of the day, are police agencies, whether it's the FBI, local police, okay. other policing agencies say, no, absolutely not. This thing isn't real. Okay. Move on. Look somewhere else. Nothing to be seen here. So what we're going to be talking about today is what's known as the smiley face killer or the smiley face murders or it's also known as the smiley face gang which is believed to be an undetected serial killer or group of killers responsible for the deaths of at least 45 college-aged men since approximately 1997. Since 1997 and still going? And (laughs) still. Still going up to this day. Okay, cool. I mean, not cool. So f- at least 45 um, yeah. since 1997. ABC7 News here in Chicago said that there are literally hundreds of cases across the country that fit the criteria of a smiley face killing. Hmm. There's even a few Facebook groups on this topic. Check out the face group, Facebook group called... The Smiley Face Killers, Updates and Discussions. Okay, cool. For the latest news on this topic. It's a really good Facebook page. When did it become popular? Do you remember the year? When did it start becoming a thing? When the internet. Really, oh, when, oh when, okay. Really with the internet. So, like in, this, so in the 90s, too. When okay. this term, okay, got Smiley it. Face Killer, really started circulating among the public. Because I've never heard of it. Well, that's the thing. It's interesting. If you ask... Most people never heard of this phenomenon. Although I think Dexter did of the, a of the smiley plot face about killer. Yeah. But if it is real mm-hmm. and not just an urban legend, the individual or individuals committing these murders are one of the most prolific, undetected killer or killers in U.S. history. Yeah, it's a pretty high count. Twenty years, twenty-one years going. It's a lot of bodies. So these smiley face killings go back to the late 1990s, and they span. 25 cities in 11 states Mm -hmm. and focus mostly right here in the Midwest United States. Right here in my house. Predominantly along the Interstate 94 corridor. Smiley face killings have happened in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois. Here in Illinois, there's 20 known cases that fit the smiley face killing profile. Damn, 20? Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. And strangely, if you remember, we talked about this in Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast episodes 67 and 68, David Politis' Missing 411. Oh, yes. Cluster areas for missing people in the four, missing 411 cases mm-hmm. include... Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and Michigan, as well as New York and Massachusetts. So the question has to be asked, is there a connection between strange disappearances and the supposed smiley face killings? Considering there's tons of overlap with Politis' cluster areas and Hmm. areas where smiley face killings are said to have happened. Now nearly all smiley face killer victims are the same. White males, college students or college age, Hmm. healthy, 
athletic, good-looking, popular, and academically successful. These are the criteria. These are the wow. profile points for nearly all of these cases. Okay, well, I'm, I'm safe. But yet it might be an urban legend. Come on. Okay. Victims are always found drowned in rivers and lakes, mm. usually after a night of drinking and partying, as autopsies of the found bodies always find alcohol in the victim's systems, and the victims were usually last seen leaving bars and nightclubs. Sometimes bodies are found the same night they went missing. Other times they're found months later, drowned, and states away. Bodies are almost always found in areas searched many, many times before by humans uh, and dogs. Okay. And bodies are often found upstream, somewhere against the currents, which is, it's not natural. It's highly unnatural. It's abnormal, yeah. Yeah, objects floating in water, like a body, they follow the current. They don't work against it. Which is another theme the smiley face killings share with strange disappearances that we discussed in episodes 67 and 68. Remember, in episode 67, we talked about this strange phenomenon of bodies being found up. Up in areas extremely tough to get to. Areas that would require huge amounts of physical exertion to get to. It's the same here with the smiley face killings. With this upstream theme, fighting against the currents. Some more commonalities between strange disappearances and smiley face killings are bodies being found in or near water. Bodies being found in areas searched tons of times before by humans and dogs. Not to mention the commonalities with cluster areas. Hmm. Yeah. Pretty striking similarities. The theory of the smiley face killer as an individual or the smiley face gang as a group of killers began in 1997 with two New York City police detectives, Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte. Or is it Duarte? It's D-U-A-R-T-E. Duarte? Uh, it could be French. If it's Spanish, it'll be like that, Duarte. Duarte, yeah. But if it's French, it's something else. I can't even begin. Yeah. Well, Anthony Duarte and Kevin Gannon. Now, Gannon and Duarte were investigating the death of a 20-year-old, 21-year-old boy named Patrick McNeil, 21-year-old man, named Patrick McNeil, along with another, uh, a number of other cases involving bodies found drowned in New York City. Hmm. Patrick McNeil was last seen drinking with friends in a Manhattan bar. When McNeil never returned home, volunteers plastered New York City with thousands of missing flyers. McNeil's drowned body was found two months later and 12 miles away near the entrance to New York Harbor. There was no evidence of foul play on the body. Now, at first, Gannon and Duarte theorized that it was an, an individual that was abducting and drowning these college-age men, okay. these bodies that were being found scattered around New York City. But they quickly updated their theory to a possible group of individuals committing these crimes because the detectives discovered that some of the crimes happened on the same night, but in vastly different parts of the state. As the two detectives started really digging into what was happening in New York, they discovered striking similarities to an abundance of similar cases happening in the Midwest. Yeah, I suppose that probably like that was like the um, when you pull on a thread and it gets worse. They were like finding out more about this thing, connecting things by based on the. So it must be more than one person. You look around and like, oh wow, it's a stretching statewide now. Yes. I mean na nationwide. Nationwide, right. right. And, and when they realized that this was also happening at a much higher rate in the Midwest, mm -hmm. that's when the smiley face killer theory was born. Okay. Now, the reason these deaths, these mysterious drownings are referred to as smiley face killings is because in at least a dozen cases, if not more, where bodies were found drowned, a graffitied smiley face was also found, kind of like a calling card spray painted on trees or other surfaces same color always Do you nope know about different color? colors okay red yellow is majority. it uh, i mean part of me to say i know that graffiti i mean tag i know some taggers and stuff and they definitely would say that there is a signature and a style to every tag the same way people can identify our handwriting right sure um but is there do, do they are they similar 
Very similar. Okay. Extremely similar. Cool. So probably but then again, a smiley face is a smiley face. It's a couple lines. Is it in traditional? Circle, like, right? is it like dot dot, or is it circle eyes? Or it's it... it's it's usually it's always circled. Okay. Um, they could be vertical, usually vertical lines for the eyes. Mm-hmm. You know, just a half upside down moon for the okay. for the for the mouth. Very and simple. Nose? No nose. Usually no nose. Okay. But little messages sometimes accompany the smiley faces when they're found. Like a message found next to a smiley face in Iowa that read, Evil Happy Smiley Face Man. And this smiley face next to the message was drawn with devil horns on it. And of course, a body was found very nearby. Almost seems like someone added into it, but maybe not also. Yeah. Okay. Now, something, something else is often found near the bodies or near the drawings of the smiley faces. And it's a single word. Sin Sinawa. Sinsinawa, I looked this up. I had to do a little research. It's a name derived from American Indian word Mm -hmm. meaning rattlesnake. Okay. Or to the Sioux Indian, Sinsinawa means home of the young eagle. No one knows what the message is supposed to mean. Then there's also the Sinsinawa Mound in Wisconsin, home to an order of Dominican nuns. Nuns who actually founded the college I graduated from, actually. The, the I, was, I was just thinking that. Yeah, the yeah. Sinsonawa Sisters of the Most Holy Rosary. Now, somehow, in this crazy story, the nuns are occasionally thrown, in, thrown into the Smiley Face Killer story, especially Sinsonawa Mound, where the nuns live up in Wisconsin. But it's wrong to do so. The word found at the site of Smiley Face Killings is spelled S-I-N-S-I-N-I-W-A, Sinsonawa. And the Dominican sisters spell it S-I-N-S-I-N-A-W-A, Cincinnati. So I can see where the mistake comes in, but trust me, the uh, the Cincinnati sisters of the Most Holy Ros- Most Holy Rosary have absolutely nothing to do. And believe it or not, it's much harder to killings. believe that nuns are out there killing than <laughs> exactly. most of the other things. <laughs> but because of the Cincinnati, Cincinnati I get it. Yeah. thing that yeah. sometimes they get thrown into... Uh, this story, especially where they live up in Wisconsin, since now a mound, because it's a large, very ornate, beautiful property, lots mm-hmm. of woods. Uh, so for some reason, they get tossed into the mix, and it's just, it's bullshit. So, but that word, Cincinnati, is often found next to these smiley faces, no. which, in a short distance somewhere around that smiley face, they find a drowned body. Watches them killing it, and then the, the sister that wrote it down, like, I'm, like, why did you give us out like that? Are people going to know it's us? Like, I misspelled it a little bit on purpose. <laughs> hey, just be a little tease. It'll be fine. No one's going to. No We're one nuns, will, bitch. No one will put it together. <laughs> We're nuns, bitch. <laughs> yeah. Watch. I'm just going to say it in case that's it. Now, what, what's, what sickens me is most of these smiley face killings have been ruled accidental by local authorities. And I kind of touched on this earlier. In fact, the FBI and other investigating agencies, like local police departments, police departments from the areas where these people go missing or where they're found dead, drowned, refuse to believe or admit that there's any sort of planning or concerted effort behind these cases, chalking them up instead to accidental drownings or the foolish actions of drunk college kids. Kids get drunk, they fall in the water and drowned. Move along. Nothing strange to see here. It happens. I mean, one is like that seems to be standard operating procedure when dealing with a massive. Uh, I can only assume how many news channels will have to cover it because it's spanning so many states. Right. Um, it's not only just common to say that as an authority of the FBI or sheriff's department, but also it's. Um, can you blame them? Well, they don't want to create a panic. I guess I could see that. I mean, if you. If, I mean, I mean, there's one of the very few times where I can say like, okay, all right. I probably would do the same. Like I didn't, wa- I wouldn't want to, for sure. But like, how else can you work? If you, I mean, you're still investigating it. <laughs> how else can you work more freely without uh, the added pressure, chaos, yeah. whatever the fuck? And you know, I mean, I mean, there there could be a, an upside to the, telling the public that it, they are connected, or like half of them are connected, or whatever. Um, meaning that you know someone could come up front, right? But then there's many people that say that they're you know oh I know the person and it's not them. Yeah. Uh, false tips. Um, there's definitely an upside, but it's like a smaller upside than it is if you just don't tell them and try to like I don't know I might do the same. Wow. Well, it's the, it's the same thing with the smiley face calling card. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, the deaths are accidental or it's just deadly college drunk hijinks move along. It's the same thing with the smiley face calling card. 
authorities are really quick to point out that the smiley face is an all-too-common graffiti symbol. Walk a few uh-huh. miles in any direction anywhere in the United States, and you're bound to find a graffiti smiley face somewhere. Again, move along, nothing to see here. Everywhere. Actually, there's a right? building next to my where I work that has it. be interesting to see if any dead bodies were found anytime soon. Is it by the water, your work? There is there a river road there, but it's not like buy it, buy it. Uh, look back in the you know, recent, from the 90s, see if any bodies were found around. Maybe that's remnants of a crime, the smiley face. I, I mean, know. yeah, maybe. But the, this is what the authorities claim. Even though there are striking similarities among the victims, and that water or drowning, quote-unquote, I'm using air quotes on drowning, because I don't think that's what's happening, is the perfect cover for a murder. Dump a victim in a body of water, and they travel with the currents. So it's extremely hard to tell where a crime actually took place, making the scene of the crime extremely hard, if not impossible, to pinpoint. No evidence. Not to mention that water can and does wash away any fingerprints, any hair samples, fiber samples from the body, uh, effectively effectively cleansing the body of any evidence. Organized killers do that for that reason. But yet it's all coincidence. Uh, Well, I mean, my my first question is, uh, is there water in the lungs of these victims? That's how you yes. know they drowned. There yes. are, there's, so at least they are probably still alive when they're being dumped in the water or something like that. In some cases, that's probably absolutely true. Because if there's water in the lungs, that means they inhaled right. water they, when they couldn't inhale oxygen. Yes. That's what that means. I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that. Cool. So that's what authority says is happening. They're, they're explaining it away. Drunk hijinks, common symbols found anywhere in the country. It's nothing, Right. But what some people believe is happening, people who believe in the smiley case killer theory, is that these college guys are being abducted, drugged into unconsciousness with a substance that is not traceable during an autopsy, then placed in the bodies of water and drowned, either by force, Mm -hmm. like they're held underwater until they're dead, or they simply drown because they're unconscious. How does really, that work? Can, can, can't you uh, jumpstart yourself if you're unconscious? If, you, if your body is trying to... I probably not if you're under far enough. So like chloroform? I mean, that probably washes away too, by the standard chloroform. Right? I would assume. Yeah, I would assume too. Over the lips and mouth? Yeah, that's gone in the, gone. In the water. And by the way, whatever you're inhaling, it's taken over for the water that you're inhaling. You know, so like it's... Yeah. Well, another thing I've heard or I've, I've read when I was researching this, this topic is that uh, these guys are being slipped GHB. The date rape drug. Oh, that old school. That's an old school date rape drug. Yeah, yeah. which I didn't know this. Apparently the body synthesizes GHB very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So by the time there is an an autopsy done on these bodies, the GHB is undetectable. It was never there. So that's another theory. Yeah, I, I, I was a big, uh, was a big selling clue point in the Veronica Mars TV show. Oh, really? GHB is what they slip her. Anyway, that's continue. nasty shit. Yeah. Now, there's rarely any evidence of violence on the bodies. No signs of abuse or torture, or strangulation, or knife wounds, or bullets, bullet holes. Nothing. That is, no evidence found on bodies that weren't too badly decomposed from sitting in water too long. Right, because some of them were found months Right, later. and water wreaks havoc on corpses. It does, it really does, and, and I mean, you're, you're, you get pruny after a half hour, right? And yeah, I mean, sitting in the tub. And you're right? alive. <laughs> right. It's also believed that in many of these cases, the victims are being held against their will for periods of time. For what reasons, no one knows. Then they're incapacitated and placed into the water, and then either forcefully drowned or they just... They're already unconscious. So it seems like the cost of death is still drowning. Yes. Especially in cases where victims are found weeks and months later in areas searched time and again by humans and animals. Rescue yeah. dogs. Mm-hmm. So people believe these, these men are being held captive yeah, somewhere, right. somewhere for some reason. So what do you think so far? I think uh, I do want to bring up something ver- a little interesting is that you would be surprised how many times, especially the more local you get. I'm sorry for you local people out there. Local meaning like, you know, not a city or not the FBI, right? Um, so you mean local as in rural? Rural, right. Okay. Sheriff's department, like a place that doesn't see a lot of murders, let's say, or whatever. Um, you be, so I, I've, I don't watch a lot of true crime stuff or forensic files or anything. I know not, I know some, 
But uh, I was listening to this other podcast. I'm not going to mention it because it's a whole other deal. But they were talking about how they watch everything, right? And uh, something they found out is that they were watching this, this magnificent, awesome show that they were into right now where every, they go out, this forensic team goes out. This is part of the show. They go out and they find a cold case and they always solve it. Okay. Um, and I'm like, and most nine times out of ten, the reason they saw it is because back then, when the murder was happening, no one thought to, no one had the resource or thought or had enough manpower or had enough money or thought to ask the very simple question that would have led them to the killer. But hmm. these people do have those things. They have a show backing them up with money. They have their own, like a top notch lab, as opposed to no lab that right. uh, another county might not have, or or the experience that the uh, coroner may not have from this town. You know, so like it's amazing how those little things that you think is common for every parish, county, and state is not as much. Hmm. Uh, so it's just simple as simple as like they just never thought to investigate the husband's fingernails. That day, they just fucked wow. up, you know. Like it could be as simple as that, and that's why they're able to solve all those murders and make a show out of it because that's how easy it should have been back then when the murders were happening. Hmm. So um, surprising. I'm like, I'm, that's why I was asking the questions about the drowning one and the lungs. People were doing this right, like <laughs> because uh, it's amazing how many people get away with murder. <laughs> because it, yeah. it, I mean, it's like when you think of the show, this one show, right? I'm like, yeah, they're, they're showing you the ones they solved, but how many have gone away? How many? cold cases are they not doing right how many like many and not to mention a city has a multiplication number to that that's like 20 times more 50 times more so like it's um it's really amazing how much just like human error is a humongous part of not even finding or or even remotely finding anyone who could be killing people Mm. Uh, i was thinking about that when you were talking about that Yeah. yeah okay because that's that's the gist of what this theory is. Yeah. You know, that it's a, it's an individual or a group of individuals mm-hmm. that are organized that operate predominantly in the Midwest and, and you Northeast. Be, you don't even have to be that organized yet. Yeah. Who focus on a certain type of person. Yeah. That young, majority, white, college student or college it's age like, man. It's like they're looking for their less status. Good looking. Right. Good looking. Yeah. Uh, academically uh, successful, in all intents and purposes, the alpha male, right? Yeah. That's who they're targeting, and they always wound up dead via drowning, water. They're found in water, and by the bodies, they find the smiley face, sometimes with Cincinnati written next to it, which no one understands what the fuck that means besides rattlesnake. So that's the theory of the smiley face killer. Right. Or the smiley face gang, okay? So I've chosen six cases. Nice. To kind of talk about okay. that show a sampling from the Midwest and the Northeast, um, of people who disappeared, how they were found, what the conditions were when they disappeared, and you can see for yourself with just six cases all the similarities. Cool. All right. So the first victim I want to talk about is known as Smiley Face Killer Victim Zero. Oh, okay. Right? Pretty, pretty official sound. And that's Patrick McNeil. That's the one that the two New York City detectives were researching right. when they started putting the together starting, this whole the start of it. That's why they theory call of smiley face killer. Yeah. Exactly. So now McNeil was 21 years old and a student at Fordham University when he disappeared from uptown Manhattan in the dead of winter on February 6, 1997. Here's a... Here's a, a um, a point here. McNeil was last seen drinking with some friends at an uptown Manhattan bar called the Dapper Dog, a bar known to overserve its patrons. When McNeil left the bar, eyewitnesses say he was pretty drunk. He was stumbling all over the place. Witnesses claim a vehicle, some strange vehicle, seemed to be following McNeil, stopping and moving again, kind of keeping pace as McNeil stumbled down the street. This is the last time McNeil was seen alive. When he didn't return that evening, 10,000 missing flyers went up. The NYPD, the New York Police Department, searched for McNeil, as did countless citizens. In fact, the search for McNeil was one of the largest missing person searches, one of the largest in New York's history. Then, on April 7, 1997, McNeil's badly decomposed body, clad only in his blue jeans and socks, was found floating face-up in the East River near Brooklyn Pier. 
12 miles away from his last known location. Because of the body's sudden appearance, the questionable circumstances surrounding his disappearance and the condition of his corpse, McNeil's case was upgraded to a potential abduction and murder pending further investigation. Detective Gannon was on the case, as I said, and he noted a lack of what's called skin slippage on McNeil's body, something that happens when a body decomposes in water, signifying to Detective Gannon that the body had not been in the water for the entire time. In fact, it was only probably in the water for a few days. Then there was the lividity at the front of McNeil's body, signifying that McNeil died while lying face down for all of his blood to settle in those parts of his body. But he was found floating face up. And that's the other weird thing about this case. When people die by accidental drowning, they're found floating face down. In fact, in 97% of drowning cases, victims are found floating face down. McNeil, of course, was found face up. In this case, there were also rope burns on his neck. Mm. Then there was the fly fly larva. Now, warning, listeners, this is kind of gross, but when McNeil's body was discovered, fly larva was found in his groin area. And not just any fly larva, household fly larva. Okay. The larva hadn't advanced to its next stage when the body was found, so it's very likely McNeil was already dead before he was placed into the water and likely kept somewhere inside. Officially, New York's chief medical examiner ruled McNeil's death, quote, an accidental drowning with the manner of death still unknown, end quote. And that's how McNeil's case sits to this day. Really? An accidental drowning with the manner of death still unknown. That's how it sits. So it's an open case? That was victim zero. That's interesting that that's the first one. That's the the, the, the kickoff. That was the kickoff. Even though was it. there most likely have been murders before that. Yeah, there was a string of these drownings, actually, in New York. This is the one that's most publicized when it comes to the smiley face killer. I wonder what led to this. Remember, they were largest. not only... Yeah. Well, um, I think it had a lot to do with Mc, uh, McNeil's parents. Um, they were like they were really pushing the case, and That's so good. this is the one that gets the most attention when it comes to smiley face. I was just wondering. No, it's a good good question. That's interesting, though. Be, um, this one, and also New York, because most of these cases are in the Midwest. Yes, it's almost like they were like they're moving, right? It's like they're like a like a like a locust um, mm, going, with, going with the wind kind yeah. of thing, you know. That will stay in a place for a few months. So, or once they settle in the Midwest, I'm like, okay, this is our parameters. Don't get, don't yeah. get too far. Um, and also, um, I'm going with, oh, most likely I'm going to go with your theory more that it's a group or at least three serial killers. And serial, for sure. Um, like Raisin Bran, you know. Um, <laughs> that, uh, but it's one of the few that uh, big ones that uh, is not from California. Because a lot of them happen to be from California. Yeah. Uh, California is in touch for once. There you go. And my point. Okay. Go ahead. Now, here's one that's right here in Chicago. Um, And this one doesn't fit all of the commonalities in that this person wasn't Caucasian. Okay. They were uh, Indian. His name was Harsha Madula. Harsha Madula. An 18-year-old pre-med student at Northwestern University here in Evanston, Illinois. Evanston, Illinois. Medulla disappeared in September of 2012. Okay. Now, he was last seen leaving a party near Northwestern's campus around 12.30 a.m. on September 22, 2012. His cell phone pinged a cell tower near Wilmette Harbor, around Wilmette next to Evanston, uh, around 1 a.m., a half hour after he left the party. When he didn't return, search and rescue went out, uh, focused on the area where his cell phone pinged near near Wilmette Harbor. Those divers and rescue teams scoured the area where that ping was and found absolutely nothing. Five days later, however, Medulla was found floating near some boats in the exact area searched by divers five days earlier, exactly where his phone pinged. 
There were no signs of foul play on Medulla's body. Mm-hmm. And if you ask yourself, did these highly trained search and rescue people, these search divers, miss Medulla's body? Likely not. So where was his body for the almost five days he was missing? There's even a witness who claimed to have had a cell phone conversation with Medulla at 12.35 a.m. on the morning in question, during which Medulla said he was already back at his dorm. Medulla was known to be a strong swimmer. Hmm. He was a bookworm. Wasn't a partier or a drinker, yet his official cause of death is, quote, accidental in nature with a contributing factor of alcohol, end quote. And here's one more detail about Medulla. Mm-hmm. A Chicago News investigation crew called the I-Team, people from Chicago know the I-Team, did find a smiley face directly across from where, directly across from where Medulla's body was found. Like on a boat or by the pier? It was by a pier. Okay. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's so he's not, cauc- not Caucasian, but some, he's... Someone stepped him something. College-aged, right? Yeah. Leaving a party. They, he normally doesn't drink or do drugs. Don't drink, don't do drugs. Yep. I think that maybe someone's been slipping these people something, so they get like extra drunk to come out. But then, right, now what are the implications of that? Who are who is that person? Who are those people that are slipping? Well, the implications of that. What do they belong to? What's the purpose? Or right? Either that, or like you know, maybe I see. Okay, my first thought when you were telling me this, us the story, is that I was thinking they just, you know, they just wait for the opportunity. You know, someone, some drunk college kid, is always going to come out of that bar, sure. right? And they just take advantage. And also, like, you know, taking. Uh, and I think I agree with you at this point. But who is they? Right. Why is there a they? Well, right? but th- and, then, and then you tell me this story, and I'm thinking either they do uh, choose their victims, bef- you know, with care, or at least more care than that sounds. In which case, they're in that bar, making sure he's drunk or slipping something if they can, or they just did it to this one guy only because the massive difference, unfortunately, is race and um, between the victims. So maybe they did slip him something on this guy because they really wanted him or needed him yeah. or wanted to kill him. Um, so they made sure that he would be intoxicated, even if he's a guy who's never drank or doesn't drink often in his life. So that's why I'm thinking either they did it for as an exception to this guy and guys like him, or or they do it for every one of their victims. In which case, then we then some of these players around the victim in, yeah. the, in the last day of lives, they probably met their killers. They kill oh them. man! Right? I mean, that is chilling. One or the other. Uh, one more profile point about Medulla that I forgot to mention was mm-hmm. uh, academically sound, academically uh, successful. Pre-med, he's yeah. no dummy. You said pre-med, right? yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's there's profile points there that match McNeil's body from back in New York in, in 90, what, 7, I said? Yes, and we'll so match So, again, others. we're going to see this common theme. Yeah. Hmm. Meeting their killers days before. Oh, that's terrifying. Yeah, or just that, that day before, you know? I don't know. <sighs> All right. Christopher Jenkins, Christopher Jenkins, a University of Minnesota student and Racine, Wisconsin native, an honor student. He was a lacrosse champion, so there's those profile points. Here's another one. Jenkins left a keg party, a party, right, keg party, uh, with some friends and headed to the Lone Tree Bar and Grill in downtown Minneapolis to celebrate Halloween. Hmm. This was October 31st, 2002. The group got to the bar around 10.30 p.m., and an hour and a half later, Jenkins was tossed from the, he was ejected from the bar for apparently, supposedly being too drunk, even though there are people who are witnesses who refute that claim that he was too drunk. After being ejected from the bar, Jenkins found himself alone, wearing only an American Indian costume. He was dressed up like an Indian, an American Indian, in 20-degree weather with no wallet, cell phone, or keys to his car or apartment. <laughs> No one's sure what happened to Jenkins after that. Initially, it was thought Jenkins, in a drunken stupor, tried to walk home across what's called the Hennepin Avenue Bridge in Minnesota, but somehow he fell over the bridge rails because he was too drunk. Oh, but, but upstream. No, but oh. there was video surveillance. Well, video surveillance of the bridge, mm-hmm. of this Hennepin Avenue Bridge, uh, from cameras mounted on a nearby Federal Reserve Bank Disprove that theory. Okay. That bridge is in clear sight of multiple cameras, and Jenkins was never seen on video walking across that bridge that night. Oh, okay. Gets a little deeper. 
it was later revealed that a group of ten men jumped another guy, possibly kind of like a gang initiation scenario, mm-hmm. in front of a pizza parlor close to the Lone Tree Bar and Grill. Jenkins was later seen in front of the same pizza parlor. Oh, shit. After he disappeared, bloodhounds, uh, you know, these highly trained rescue search dogs, picked up on Jenkins' scent in front of this same pizza parlor on two separate occasions. Okay. Two different dogs, two separate occasions. And both dogs led their handlers to a parking garage next to the pizza parlor and to a specific sp- parking spot where a few drops of blood were found, as was a red feather. The feather possibly from Jenkins in Native Indian American, custom, yeah. Right? But that's it. From there, all trails went cold. So what happened to Jenkins? Four months later, Jenkins' body was found on the east side of the Mississippi River near the spillway of the St. Anthony Falls Hydroelectrical Laboratory. Jenkins was found floating on his back with his arms crossed in front of his chest. The medical examiner initially ruled his death accidental drowning. But Jenkins' family didn't like this ruling. So they consulted with global experts in water rescue and recovery and also with renowned forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Badden. Now, they listeners, bones, huh? you know, yeah, listeners might remember Dr. Badden from the long-running, wildly popular HBO undercover documentary series called Autopsy. I remember loving this series back in the mid to late 90s. Anyway, the experts weren't happy with the medical examiner's conclusion either. Mm-hmm. First, it's how the body was found. Face up, cross due to, due, yeah, Due to our natural inclination to try to swim and not drown, victims are mostly found, like I said earlier, 97% in drowning face cases up. face down, right. our arms out towards their sides, clothing disheveled, and one or both shoes missing. Jenkins was found, of course, face up, arms not at sides, but instead crossed at his chest. His shirt was still tucked into his drawstring pants. He was still wearing his slip-on shoes. Slip-on shoes. Yeah. And his necklace and ring were on each hand. This was enough to change the status of the case from accidental drowning to homicide. But, of course... No one was ever brought to justice. Right. And, you know, murders like that. I mean, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's crazy that they had to bring in, like, outside help. Right? Yeah. Well, these families are like, I know my kid. Right. My kid wouldn't. Because uh, so a lot of these cases, they say, well, the guy got drunk, went to take a piss into a lake or a river, slipped and fallen, drowned. Also, the more you're telling me the stories and the circumstances that lead up to their deaths um, in each case, uh, I feel like... Maybe it's not so much as um, because maybe it's not so much as like people like you know at the top of the show we're saying how they, the FBI and uh, authorities local and 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 national are right. saying that they're accidental or coincidence. I think maybe it could just be a case of like well when it gets to the FBI's desk or 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 a different county desk, um, like they get to a desk and they ask you know the the person the detective or the officer that found the body or whatever. I'm like, how does it look? It looks like an accident. And like they all, maybe everyone assumes it's that until it's proven to be a murder, and then people just keep asking the authority figures below them that are there on the scene, um, and they just take their advice. They just take their word for it that it's an accident. Hmm. It could be a mixed match of that kind of thing. And everyone keeps hearing accidents and like, well, the only people who are not saying accident, are, of course, they're bereaved parents and conspiracy nuts. So yeah, right, people you know, like me, right. <laughs> Right, so maybe maybe it's a little more innocent than we think. I don't know, but it makes making me think a little of that. I'm not saying I'm letting them off the hook. I'm Good, saying, thank you. <laughs> I was getting worried there for a minute. Nope. We'll, um, we'll see at the yeah. end what you think. Okay. You know, but um, you, you're right, it, and it's easy. Uh, it's an accident. Less paperwork. Move on. Yeah. What's also, next? I mean, a, you know, a coroner, God knows the the workload of a particular day, week, or year, or lifetime of uh, having to pass all these cases. I mean, I don't know. what are you gonna do? I don't know. If I can, if I can let slip and make a latte a little less, you know, regular to make it faster, uh, I would do it. Imagine that to hundreds of cases of people's lives in your hands or whatever. It could happen. Yeah. Anyway. Well, here's another interesting one. Matthew Genovese, a Fordham University graduate, Fordham like McNeil oh. was from Fordham. 
a Fordham University graduate who worked on Wall Street and uh, a relative, interestingly, of Real Housewives of New Jersey star Carolyn Manzo. So he deserved it. (laughs) I'm kidding, (laughs) kidding. Now, Genovese was 24 years old when he disappeared after leaving McSwiggins, a Hoboken, (laughs) New Jersey bar, during a blizzard on January 23rd, 2016. Genovese told his friends he was going to go home after he left the bar at 11.30 p.m. According to police, Genovese's walk home should have been a familiar, easy 10-minute walk west. Instead, for some unknown reason, he walked east towards the Hudson River. Why head to the water in the blistering cold in a blizzard? Doesn't make sense. Police divers pulled Genovese's body from the icy waters of the Hudson River three days later. His wallet, which with cash and credit cards still in it, uh, were found along with his okay. keys near a waterfront railing, actually uh, poking out of the snow. Really? So, not a robbery. No. Right? No obvious fo- uh, signs of foul play were on Genovese's body. He was still dressed in the clothes he was wearing when he disappeared. A gray Fordham t-shirt, a red, orange, and gray flannel shirt over the t-shirt, khaki pants, and Timberland boots. Now remember, what did Dr. Michael Badden say? Michael Badden said clothes are going to be all torn up and disheveled. Well, disheveled, I shouldn't say torn up, disheveled. And they're going to be missing shoes, either one or both, when it comes to drowning. Right. Now according to police... There were upwards of eight video cameras aimed at the exact spot where Genovese is thought to have entered the Hudson River. In fact, the cameras covered the entire waterfront area, but not a single camera caught Genovese that night. The medical examiner determined that Genovese's death was an accident and intoxication played a role. Now, crazy, just one month before the Genovese tragedy... Anthony Urena, another Hoboken resident and student at Lehman College, was pulled from the Hudson River on Christmas Day after having been missing for several months. Urena was last seen leaving a bar called the Cliff Lounge in Upper Manhattan on November 4th. And in March 2014, yet another Hoboken resident, 27-year-old named Andrew Jarzik, disappeared after drinking with friends at a Hoboken bar. A month later, he too was pulled from the Hudson River. Two. A lot of Hoboken. A lot of Hoboken, yeah. A lot of Hoboken, a lot of uh, Hudson River. Mm-hmm. That's what, two years? 14 to 16? Three people. Different. Th- same circumstances. Different levels of like, waiting before finding the body, also. One's months, yes. one's days. Yeah. Um, Fucking crazy. Way too. Way, it, that is not coincidence, man. Yeah, maybe they maybe they had like a, a I don't know. I can't imagine these killers like, well, we have a sale on staying in this hotel <laughs> Fire in Hoboken, sale. in Hoboken for extra days. We just get a few here or whatever. I don't know what they're thinking, but I'm saying like that's crazy to choose there of all places. And, and from some of the research I was doing, it's not common to have tragedies hit Hoboken, that particular neighborhood of New Jersey. It's not very common. Okay. And within two years, three Hoboken guys dying in the same circumstances really shook that community. Now, I've never been to Hoboken. I know people who, who live in that area or whatever. And it's, from what I could tell, uh, a nice area. Good good, good place to be, mm-hmm. Hoboken. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe we have New York listeners out there who would contest that. If you do, write us. Content. Well, they're from New York, though, so they will contest anything you offer them. <laughs> right, but three from that same area dying in the same circumstance. Not coincidental. Hmm. Nick Wilcox, a 24-year-old University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee student who disappeared on New Year's Eve 2013. Wilcox was last seen, last seen leaving a bar called the Irish Rec Room in Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin and heading down an alley near the bar between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. That's when he disappeared. Wilcox's badly decomposed body was discovered in the Milwaukee River on March 28, 2013, near where he was last seen. His cell phone, wallet, and keys were still on him. An autopsy revealed that no trauma or injuries on Wilcox's body, other than 
normal decomposition, uh, was found, and the medical examiner listed his cause of death as accidental drowning. Right. Wilcox's blood alcohol concentration was 022 twice the legal limit which is 0.08 so again this is uh you know in the uh, 94 corridor leaving a bar intoxicated white male found drowned do you think um i know we're not done with the case we have one more left. i have one more yes i'll wait till then okay you sure yes Okay. Then I won't do my exit until you're done. <laughs> like when I did on episode oh, yeah, yeah. 68. What was it? Um, episode 68, 68, I gave my exit. Oh, yes, still. that's right. I'm not going to do that this time. Okay, cool. Thomas Hecht. Hecht. Uh, 28 years old when he disappeared. So a little bit older than the others. Hecht, but, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm, not uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, I mean, this is tragic shit. You got to, you know, we're, we're not making light of it. We're not mocking, but... Got to make it more digestible. It's not quite like, um, you know, how soldiers in war will make fun of, like, rolling heads of their buddies because they have to cope with the insanity. It's yeah. not quite that, that or but people also that, or, we're distant from work the op- violence. Yeah, work uh, trauma rooms, things yes. like that. They have to distance themselves. Right. So. They're, 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 yeah, so we're don't distancing hate us. <laughs> from something that people we don't know. So, right. right. And it's horrible. It's horrible. We're trying to distance us and you from that horribleness. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. We'll give us some chills, but we're going to be last. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thomas Hecht, 28 years old, as I said. Hecht was last seen at Rosie's Bar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, while he was participating in the Shamrock Shingding pub crawl on March 10, 2012. Three weeks later, Hecht's body was pulled from the Milwaukee River. He was still fully clothed. Medical examiner said there was no trauma to Hecht's body and that he died from accidental drowning. <laughs> His blood alcohol concentration was also point. Two two exactly point two two, mm. just like Nick Wilcox. I think again, that's a Wisconsin thing. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> again, that's twice the legal limit, which is point oh eight. In both Wilcox and Hex cases, the Milwaukee River was scoured by divers and searchers, and not a thing was found until it was. Until like it needed to be found. Until it needed to be found. Exactly. It's exactly what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. So again, these common uh, profile points with these two Milwaukee guys or these two Wisconsin guys. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if this is okay, how do I start? How do I start? Well, I can tell you this: the list yeah. does unfortunately go on and on. Yeah. On well, and on. And, we don't uh, have time. Yeah, to go through just the names and the wares, right, on the house, and then before you know, and it's, the profile points. Before you know, it's and, been three hours. Right. Um, gotcha. Yeah, there's a lot, and we can really go on and on. I like how you just pick a few. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, like, if I had another thought two cases ago where is it possible that they're choosing they, him, her, it, whatever, they're choosing um, white male of a certain age because is that the easiest demographic victim they can get? Do not <sighs> girls. A big, a big, big difference right there because most kidnappings are women yeah. or children. Yeah, the people that would look out for the most when it comes to because everyone's seen them, everyone thinks about that. Least common are <laughs> straight white guys. Oh, not straight, but white guys. Just the least common. Um, not to mention the fact that um, their youth, virality, virility and uh you know the fact that they go out partying all the time is such a common thing it's almost like the coroner has a pre-stated pre predestined response when it comes to finding a white guy 20 something college boy drowned like oh drank too much he fell you know it's right. so common it's uh, the answer is there for him it's a it's an open book test kind of thing <laughs> and um i wonder if if that is a factor or the factor as to why this person or group of people are killing these guys. Do you think, how much of that do you feel is the reason? I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm lost on the question. Like, well, is it, do they need to kill these kinds of people or do they want to kill anything but these are the best kinds of people they can kill? To get away with it. I think it's someone who has someone or a group of someone's who have something against 
white, successful, seemingly successful mm-hmm. college age people. Okay. Men. Men. So college like so, it just happens it to align. Is it happens to ha- so for you it happens to align with like not only do they want to kill these people, but it happens to align with the easiest victims they can kill. Yeah, I don't know if it makes them easy. Easier. I don't, I don't, know, if I don't know if it's an easy nothing demographic. Is, nothing but is I, easy, but easier. Easier. Yeah. Um, Maybe. So I don't know if that demographic is necessarily easier. I don't know if that's their 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 what's making them choose this particular type of person. Mm-hmm. I think it's something they have against that type of demographic. It does seem personal. Like exactly, like it's personal. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have said that myself. I was just uh, just a, something that came up in my head. Yeah, no, it was a great question. I I just I don't think they look at it as an easy target. I think they look at it as. The target. Those are the people that need to be exterminated for whatever reason. So you do think it's personal? You think it's only human? I think it's personal. Yeah, I really do. Okay, I really do. Can it be? Uh, you know, a jealousy. No, jealousy. I, I was thinking jealousy. My first thought was jealousy more than like, um, like a like you know got bullied so much. You know? Right. Well, think about it too. And these people, if if they are being held somewhere, mm-hmm. like some of the theory states that, especially people that go missing for long periods of time and the bodies are found in areas already searched, they're being held somewhere. What's happening during this holding period? That is a person, if it's happening, that is a person dominating, terrifying, who knows, terrifying, what, mental them, torture. Maybe, it is I'm power over. Torture, yelling over them, you know. It could be anything. Like that. Fuck, they could be waterboarding. We have no idea what they're doing. But it, mm-hmm. I think it is trying to display a power over a certain type of person. But not physically, like, harming. You get the right, because no. in very few of these cases are any, except for the one um, that I found, McNeil, where he had the rope marks yes. on his neck. Otherwise, there's no physical evidence of any sort of torture on these bodies. Mm-hmm. So it's got to be psychological. It's mental. It could be anything that won't inflict damage to a body. Yes. And I can't even imagine what that type of torture could even entail. And we would never know. Um, unless they're filming them, maybe we find it one day. Uh, that'd be interesting. Uh, no, uh, so you don't think? Now, before I ask a question, before I give you another theory, um, did you think of any? Not that we have to supernatural component to why this is happening. If this is a unknown cult up to this point, mm-hmm. maybe to them there's a supernatural element to these type of killings, this type of demographic? I thought there is, but you, they think... They think, they think. Yeah. absolutely, sure. sure. Yeah, I was thinking that. I was thinking the cult angle because of uh, the organization uh, uh, element, yeah. the multiple people element. It's kind of hard to find. I mean, I'm not saying it's super hard to find people that communally hate this one demographic, uh, but usually kind of reserves to one person doing it personally. You know, yeah. you don't combine that. Even if you stretch out to two people, not more than that. And this seems to require more than two people. It does. So, and, and also like a lot of money to you know, make sure that you're okay while you have to travel and do all these things. Hold this person. Hold this person. What, what type of drug are they using? They've got to be spending money on GHB, Everything. And, Everything for example. Everything requires resources right? and yeah. not, to not get caught because they want to keep doing it. Yes. Now, if they didn't care about that, they would have been caught already because they wouldn't care about their well-being. Yeah, and let's not forget that Sin Sinua. Yes. You know, the rattlesnake. I mean, what the fuck does that mean? It just seems like maybe they just have too many members and one of them just fucking does it every once in a while. <laughs> just, just goes right? off on their own. Like you go almost make a, 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 a goofball I don't know. dark comedy of it. Like, you know, like you always have to write your calling card and it'll say. <laughs> right, right. Um, like, well, you got to kill the last guy. In like a really dark comedy. Um, I don't know. I'm spitballing. Another one could be like, uh, you know, a loose connection to the. Um, the whole national parks. Um, the yeah, there's some common threads there too. The missing 411 thing. Like, what if this is a byproduct or an after effect or, or a side effect of uh, going going crazy in the events of other missing 411 actual cases are happening? People go nuts and something happens like this. I don't know why. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm not saying that's 100%, but I'm saying, you know. Some of them do fit that. Well, they're in cluster areas. Right, they're in cluster areas. The majority of these, these deaths or killings, whatever you want to call them, happen in known cluster areas. Yeah. That David Polite just pointed out with his missing 411 research. It's crazy. It's, mm-hmm. it's crazy. Yeah, it's not so. Uh, and, and 
the smiling face thing. Why the calling card? It's 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 taunting. It's taunting authorities. It's, it's taunting the ego. general public. It's ego. It's ego. Absolutely. That's that's what I think. Yeah. It's taunting. Yeah. It could have been a a dick that they're drawing all over. Regardless, it's a calling card. It's saying like American Vandal. Or something. Look what we're doing. Oh, that's a good documentary. Uh-huh. It's a look what we're doing. We're doing it again. We're still not caught. It's taunting. Absolutely. Yeah. The more, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely leaning more in a. It's 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 just humans hating on humans. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a demon doing this. I don't think that nah. it, these are just scum scumball well, scuzzball humans nah, doing the it to funny, humans. The like funny, you said. ironic. This is how life can be. Sometimes will be that this is the by far the most supernatural thing we've ever come close to. We we'll just never know. <laughs> like it is the devil himself going. Like the smiley this. face okay. is actually some secret unknown right. occult symbol. Every, it's connected that, to everything. <laughs> and the missing for all wonder, like they just fall weird. <laughs> They fall weird. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's the least one, you know, like yeah. the one we hype up the most is the least, and the one we think the least of is the probably the most. So, ha- so has the missing 411, I know we're backtracking to other episodes, but yeah. has the missing 411 episodes been the most impactful for you as far as crazy supernatural shit happen, happening? Like, if I was going to have like a, a scale? If, if for your personal, yeah. Ah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I almost feel like I want to watch some of the titles of our recent episodes because we've um, talked about so much on this podcast. So many. I think. Topics. I think. I think. Missing and CERN are are top two, but CERN isn't supernatural. Oh, CERN. More like okay, gotcha. more like it opens up doors. So uh, yeah, I think. I think yeah, I think I'm going to go with that. I we like the Bermuda, uh, Bermuda Michigan Triangle. The Lake Michigan Triangle. Wow. Okay. Okay. But uh, I think Missing 401 did more, and I hope it's not just recency bias. Uh, I just think it does. I think it does. I, maybe ask me again um, in a few months. See how I feel you about got it. it. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, don't don't let them forget, guys, to ask me in a few months. <laughs> there you go, listeners. You have a task. Another task. I I personally think that this is being covered up for whatever reason. Whether authorities know about it and and allow it to happen because there's bigger powers at play there or whether they just don't want to incite panic among the general public, whether they want to admit that uh, they're just incompetent, they can't catch these people. I mean, it's admitting defeat. It's admitting defeat. Good. That's a good way to put it. I think it is real. There's way too many coincidences. I do think it is a gang. So I'm going with the smiley face gang theory. Mm-hmm. Um, it, this is not an individual. For some reason, they are they're they're organized. They have a mission that is clear. Uh, I just don't know what that is. I think yes, smiley face is real. And the crazy thing is, is even if half of the total deaths said to be smiley face killings are actually just accidents or suicides or just drunk college kids being drunk college kids, like the authorities say, even if half are that. What does that say for the other half? That's a shockingly high number in the other category, quote-unquote other category. And throw in the fact that those in the other category share so many common traits, that means there's an epidemic happening right under our noses. Who are the culprits? Is it a single person or a group? Is it some unknown cult? What's their motive? What's their system of beliefs? How are they concealing their tracks so effectively? Why the smiley faces? What does Cincinnati mean? And most importantly, how long will these killings go on?